West Virginia has had more individuals serve in our armed forces per capita than any other state in the nation. There's no question you can't go back in time. Once the people are gone, history is lost forever. But what we can do, and the important element that we need to do, is to make sure that that doesn't happen in the future. We need to hear the voices of the people that actually participated. We need to preserve that for the future. And that truly was the whole reason, the genesis of the Veterans Legacy Project. The state of West Virginia was actually born from war, the Civil War. This region might have broken off from Virginia sometime or other. There certainly were differences between the two peoples. That conflict settled the question, and in 1863, West Virginia became a state. West Virginia uh, straddled the border between North and South, and, and like the other border states, it, it really suffered because of that. It suffered economically, physically, emotionally. You know that old cliche about brother fighting brother? Well, in West Virginia, that, that really happened. So many West Virginians were witnesses to the defining moment of the creation of West Virginia. But there was not much in the way of technology to record or preserve what they saw or what they felt. We have to rely on photographs, the occasional letter, anecdotal evidence, and the few little pieces of the puzzle that we can put together at this time. Wouldn't it be fantastic if we had the first-hand accounts from soldiers from the War of 1812 or the Civil War? I would advise to sell any property or anything that you have on the place if necessity refrains. If I should not return before corn planting, I want you to have some corn planted in the best of ground where we had corn year before last. You will be able to do the best you can and hire someone to do your spring work if I am not there in time to do it myself. Nothing more at present, but I remain your dear Joe until death, Joseph Tennell. We're missing our primary sources, and primary sources are exactly what you, you would think they are. They're, they're first person accounts. They're right from the horse's mouth. And in American history, we have you know, very few of those before the Industrial Revolution. And it, even 100 years ago, I'd be hard pressed to say that, that we had them. I've had students come before me, you know, saying something about their parents or grandparents had told them a story that I thought was rather interesting. It's like, you, you've got to get that down. You've, you've got to record that. Because if they pass away before you do, that's lost. If you had a chance to go back and interview the soldiers at Gettysburg, a World War I soldier in the trenches, would it upset you if it wasn't a perfectly lit interview or that the recording might have been or might be scratchy? I don't think so. In 2001, we were looking at doing an, an oral history of the college, but also um, the idea of an oral history of West Virginians who served in the military. The project started out pretty modestly. Um, it was basically focused on Gilmer County World War II veterans only. And through those efforts, there were only about 20 some interviews done here in Gilmer County. And there was another group in Fairmont doing the exact same thing. And through, through a period of time, those interviews eventually became donated to the Glenville State College Archives also. Between 2001 and 2010, 
the college has continued or did continue to maintain their emphasis in trying to create and get the archives up and going. We have to recognize the efforts and the support of Congressman Mollihan, but also the former First Ladies, Irene Powell, Sandy Freeman, and now my wife Betsy, heavily involved with the archives. We also have to recognize the contribution of Larry Seipold, who guided the effort, unfortunately, has passed. In early 2012, we lost Larry, but the efforts that he, that he was focused on survived. Um, by August, we'd, we'd accumulated 200 interviews. In 2010, Glenville State College received a substantial grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. That grant enabled us to hire personnel and to purchase technologies and equipment that have been able to digitalize, record, upload, create websites, and do many of the things that this project is, entails. It became quite obvious from the outset that if we would gather all this information, put it in the archives where only a few historians would have the opportunity to come and see it, we would lose a major opportunity. It was more important that this become a living, continuing, breathing project. It's difficult for us to imagine what a huge undertaking World War II was and the huge sacrifice that so many families in America had to undergo. In today's day with jet plane travel, the internet, communications, instantaneous communications, where you can talk to a soldier on the battlefield from all across the world, it's hard for us to realize what a huge action it was for us to go into World War II, where one might not hear from their loved one for months, if not years. That was a huge sacrifice. It was a sacrifice not just for the men fighting, but for the families that were left behind, wondering what was taking place across the ocean. What you had were these strategic alliances, and on one side, on, on the Axis side, you had fascism, uh, racial cleansing, uh, the desire to, uh, their, fan their fanaticism, this idea that their destinies were better than anybody else's. Uh, this is Germany, it's Italy, it's Japan. On the other side, on the Allied side, initially in 1939, you've got Great Britain, France, right off the bat. We, the United States, we're, we're across the ocean, we're on the other side. And at that time, we're in a period of isolationism. We don't want to get caught up in another European conflict. Um, so, December the 7th, 1941, when Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, things change. Most folk know that in World War II, when you went overseas, you went to stay. The only way that you could get back was one of two ways maybe three. You got wounded, could no longer serve, or you gained enough points that gave you enough points that you could come home. The third way, of course, was you gave your life for your country. Well, it's something that I had to do, and so, and everybody else was doing it, and, and uh, so, you know, we were all, I know I was, you know, so we're going, whether we fight or whether we get back or what's going on, I said, I don't know, and really didn't care too much about it. Never been away from home for Christmas. In the singing platoon, we broadcast over a station in New York City one day. And it was in December sometime, the song we sang was I'll Be Home for Christmas. And I was staring at the tears running down my face because I wasn't going to be there. I was in Georgia for Christmas. Was not one bit afraid of a Japanese soldier. Not one. I do not know why, but I was not afraid of him. But his artillery could put the fear into me. And they, they, at night time anyhow, when you're trying to get some sleep and you know you can't rest, you can't rest during the war, there's no rest there. Uh, and they're shooting at you all night long and all day long. I sent word 
up to the front, had his man come up the front. He wanted the oldest man up there. It didn't matter about his rank. He just wanted the oldest person up there. So uh, he come and got me. I was the oldest one up there. I was 20, 24 at the time. And <clears throat> I was talking about uh, uh, one had to move service up on the front. Uh, so I went back, they took me back, and I went in and saluted Patton. And he said, are you the fella I sent for? I said, yeah, I guess. He said, well, you're not what I was looking for. I said, how's that? He said, I was looking for a big, rough-looking fella like me. He said, no worry, you be up there as long as you're so little they can't hit you. <laughs> that was, so uh, <clears throat> he told me, he said, I want you to take at least 50 men. I want you to drive a wedge right in that city, just like the, that's right where we're going to invade it from. He said, I'm going to split my army. He said, we're going to go in on the inside, uh, on each side. And he said, I'm going to take that city. With some people, that they would talk about the things that went on in the service and what all they'd seen. And I tried to block that out of my memory, out of my mind. I never even told my children. D-Day was a, a moment that changed the world forever. The military uses the term D-Day to denote when an operation is going to commence. This has become synonymous with not only when an operation is going to commence, but with the largest land, air, amphibious operation of modern history. On June 6, 1944, when General Eisenhower oversaw the launching of our allied troops onto the beaches of Normandy, it was a moment that we had come to anticipate, but we anticipated it with dread because we knew so many casualties would take place on that day. 160,000 men participated in the storming of the beaches of Normandy. trying to hold her gun in. She, that'll never leave me. Well, I don't know if I thought, you know there's so much and you, your battle, the battle is just you. That's all you see, you, uh, uh, the, the guys that are immediately right around you. I got, well, that one guy killed and I got one wounded. Just in the bandages, slow of life. Took me around behind the hospital to a tool shed. They put me in that tool shed. In there was about a dozen other POWs, some badly wounded. That night, a lieutenant passed away. So these guys took his clothes, his coveralls off. He was in the Air Force and they put him on me. I was taller than them, so they cut him in two so much. Part of my body was still naked, you know. <laughs> From there, they put us on a train. Every time the train moves, night or day, 
either the Army or British would straight the train. There was 32 men to a small boxcar. Some of these people would be killed and wounded. I was on the train for three days, no food or water. I'd just like to be able to tell uh, what it's like the first time you run a bayonet through a man. Uh, I know he's your enemy, you'll kill you, you'll kill him, but uh, it's still the first time you get an awful feeling. World War II started out as a conventional war, but it, it certainly didn't end that way. Uh, by May of 1945, Hitler's dead, the war in Europe's over. It's going to take them decades to recover from that destruction. But Japan's still fighting at this time. And uh, with battles like Saipan, Iwo Jima, uh, the United States leadership is realizing it's going to be a, a very, very devastating encounter. Uh, so it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't end, on, it doesn't end conventionally. We're going to drop two atomic bombs, one on Hiroshima and one on Nagasaki to bring this to its conclusion. But uh, while I was there, the, uh, the Nola Gay, the one that dropped the atomic bomb, they, they landed there. And I helped check it over and refuel it, sent it on into the Tinian with it, with the atomic bomb up. And we left there long about the time the second one was dropped and went to Honolulu. When we arrived there, they were celebrating victory because on September the 2nd, remember, Japan capitulated for a second bomb. And uh, they were, so we got to uh, see the parade, or maybe even be in them, I don't know, in Honolulu. Then we went on to Okinawa. When I got up the next morning uh, at Okinawa, you could see Allied ships as far as you could see, this is Buckner Bay. You could see Allied ships as far as you could see in every direction. They were all getting ready for the November 1st invasion of Japan. They wanted to come back and return to their lives in, in rural West Virginia and, and settle down and, and build their lives and try to put the war behind them. When I returned to my hometown of Fairmont, West Virginia, The city turned out in full force. And as a country boy, I was absolutely overwhelmed. I, I, at a point, I couldn't even carry on a conversation because my emotions were right on my sleeve. And I've never felt more pride in my life than I did that November the 6th, 1945, when I came home. While I was in, my mother had to give up the farm that I was born and raised on because she couldn't get enough people to work the farm to keep it going, so she had to dispose of it. Naturally, that was the first place that I really wanted to see when I got home. And I went to see it, but somebody else owned it. And it didn't mean quite as much as it did when I left. World War II was scarcely over when new problems started to arise around the world. Under the umbrella of the Cold War that was emerging, America was finding itself in conflict with those countries who, many of whom, had been allies of the United States in World War II. In the case of the Korean conflict, we had China looking to exert its influence in the Pacific area. The Soviet Union was emerging as our chief rival across the globe. The peoples of North and South Korea were looking to solve their own problems but they had the global superpowers trying to solve it for them. And then when I got over into Korea, there's one of them Chinamen trying to sneak up on us, and I shot him. 
and uh, they said that uh, they said that place was mine. And don't go down in there. See, well the, ca uh, the company commander was we'll checked down there the next day and took a uh, 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 rifle off of him and uh, gave it to me. And the guys were talking about it. Said it was dark out like last night. He said no moon or no nothing. He said how did he see the shoot that guy between the eyes? And one of the guys said, he must have eyes like a cat. So the army guys called me cat. We had a five-man crew. You had a driver, assistant driver, gunner, loader, and a commander. The biggest thing you had to look out for when you was in battle, you had to watch out for snipers. They loved, they loved to knock off tank commanders. And we had a few of our tank commanders get knocked off. My cousin, James Armentrout, to Corey in 1950. And he was a dear brother to me. And when I found out he was missing and he never showed up, I decided one of them boys over there killed him, so I'm going to see if I can get in and kill two of them. Well, the uh, tanks was not totally suitable for Korea. They were a good defense weapon because you couldn't get off the road, kind of the ice, rice paddies. They were stuck on the road most of the time. And uh, if you got into a far fight, you were stuck on the road. You couldn't turn around, backing up on a turn around on a road took a, quite a while. And you couldn't afford to get in the rice paddies because you got stuck and you lost your tank. We started out with uh, 42 men. Three weeks later we had 13. And the soon leader was the first guy, first guy to get our platoon was jinxed for, toward uh, Tune leaders, about four or five of them. Must have been in February. It was, it was up on this hill, and uh, you go through the kitchen, they had a, had a tent for, for, fixed into a kitchen. You get co coffee be boiling hot, and you take it out, and if you didn't hurry up and drink it, it'd, be, it'd turn into ice on you. The cold weather and the rain, the, the monsoon season was probably as bad or worse than the Korean winters. Of course, up north, the Korean winters was hell. We didn't get our winter time gear in until late. When we moved across the 38th parallel going north for the, for the winter time, uh, it got rough. Some of the infantry around the frozen chosen, they called it, it was hell for them. And the armor, we were a little bit better off, or maybe say quite a bit better off, because we had uh, a tank, and when you run the engine, it's got hot, and you can jump on the back deck and warm up pretty fast. The Battle of Heartbreak Ridge was an example of extreme bravery. Um, you have uh, in the hills, the rugged, sharp hills of North Korea, American troops are fighting a combined enemy of North Koreans and, and Chinese at this time. Um, this happens in September 1951, and when it's over, there's going to be some 3,000 U.S. and U.N. troops that are killed, but they're going to take out 25,000 of the enemy as well. You know, I haven't carried the whole, whole year. We moved up, we relieved the 2nd Division in, uh, I think it was October. Uh, on heartbreak, and uh, the company runner had, I think he rotated back to the States, and I asked this guy, he, at one time he was my assistant on the BAR, but he got promoted and made Sergeant First Class, and full-blooded Indian from Oklahoma, not, I mean Oregon, and uh, I said, green old buddy, how about putting me in for company runner? I'm getting carried, carried that VAR. So he said, see what I can do. 
about an hour later, he come back and said, move your gear up there, old went by the old man mucker there, and you're a company runner now. My connection at home was real fine, and uh, I got depressed. I didn't write home for maybe a month or five weeks or so. And the company commander called me in one day, and he was angry at me. He told me, showed me a letter he got from my mother. So here's what you got to do. Sit down right now, write your mother a letter, and I'll put it in the envelope and seal it and mail it to her. We landed at Seattle, Washington, and uh, a shipload of us. And we had um, some Red Cross workers with donuts and coffee. The only thing that gave us a welcoming back. find ourselves in the middle of the 1960s, right in the middle of the Cold War. Then all of a sudden, we're in the middle of a very hot war in a place many of us have never heard about, a place called Vietnam. One thing that motivated me was that I wanted to see the world. We were fortunate, I think, that at least you were getting news within 24 hours of it happening, even though it was programmed and edited and produced and all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't totally foreign to us, but the only knowledge that you had is what you got from newscasts. And what news people often do is glorify the bad things and not so much glorifying the good things. So I was, I was pretty aware. And then, when the, and then when the death toll started rising in every front page of every major paper was you know, 360. And if I'm not mistaken, they kept these counts by the week. And then at the end, and on Sundays, they'd run these papers, you know, 365 killed. So that, that straightened me up real quick, that it, it wasn't going to be squirrel hunting on the farm. My mother was fearful, and my mother was probably the crier. Uh, my father was a pretty stoic guy, didn't say a lot. Um, but they were sitting around one night, and this was a few days before I left. And uh, he said, uh, uh, don't dishonor your country and don't dishonor your family. And if you keep those things in mind, you'll be fine. And that's all he ever said to me. What do I remember most? The constant incoming uh, from the enemy, the mortar rounds, the artillery rounds. Uh, we went from June the 18th till April the 6th with incoming every day. I mean, it was just a constant, constant thing. I would take the map and orientate it with my compass. And when we were ready, I led the way, you know. And uh, we get to an ambush point, and you wait till just almost dark. We were walking together, him and I, leading the way. We were about maybe 50 feet apart. There was mortar started hit. And uh, the mortar attack and rockets 
they were shooting rockets and mortars and we had nowhere to go. We were laying on the ground. He said, get ready. They're coming after us. Excuse me. One of the times when we got uh, we got the airplane up and away. In fact, it was the last time I, I did one because I was I had like two weeks left in country and I was mm -hmm. training the next the next people to pick up airplanes. And uh, the perimeter that the Marines had set up around us was uh, being overrun on the one side by uh, the Viet Cong, and they were pushing back. And it was it was elephant grass, big tall brushy and stuff. You could hardly see through the stuff. But our plane was right up against it. So by the time we got the airplane out of there, the helicopter gone, the Marines are falling back past our position. And um, our pilot that was circling over called in a napalm drop from an airstrike. And normally, <laughs> if you got troops on the ground, you set it up you know, across the way so you're not coming right out. This guy set this drop up coming right at us. And when I looked up, there was an F-4 Phantom dumping napalm bombs off of his wing tanks, and it was cumbling. They, they tumbled in over and coming. It looked like it was going to hit us, you know. I, I just stopped to wait and see what was going to happen because you can't run far enough to get out. I would have, that's what we did all of the time I was there was drop that stuff. I guess they're probably shooting at the, the airplanes parked out there behind us, but one of them hit our tent. And we had eight boys, eight gentlemen in there, and then four of us got out, four boys got killed in the, the direct hit. And I lost half my right lung. And Ended up being in the hospital for about six months after that. I was lucky to, to get out of it, to be honest with you. Very lucky. Um, some of the women that I talked to that were actually deployed to Vietnam as nurses or whatnot were uh, relayed to me that, that people thought they were crazy. I mean, even the other men would say, uh, you know, why are you here? You know, why would you choose to come here? And uh, basically they would say, you know, to help. Well, we were, uh, they were built up in Vietnam, so we were the largest uh, nursing group that they had at that time. And uh, they uh, didn't have housing for us, so we lived in motels out off, off the base. And then they bust us into the base uh, for our training. Saying, asking you or pleading with you, you know, can't you do something so I don't have to go back out, you know. And uh, then, you know, even saying, well, you know, I'm going out there to be killed. And then that was, that's the hard part, you know, going to the wall. I don't really know any names on the wall, but yet uh, I, I wonder, you know, wonder how many of those that I may have cared for be on the wall. I, I don't guess. That the only thing that I would like to to say, you know, like like I'm a Vietnam veteran, they got a wall. You know, everybody that's got killed is on the wall. But like me, you know, I've got Agent Orange. And you know, when you know, when I die I'll be just as dead as the rest of them. You know, I ain't taking nothing away from them, maybe it was me and all of them in, you know, but, but there's just no, you know, no room on the wall for me, you know, it's, that's probably the only thing that makes me bitter, you know, the whole deal. sure how you explain those emotions. Um, for one thing, people that don't do that sort of thing don't understand it very clearly. And at that time in the U.S., there was that anti-war thing developing. So you weren't coming home as a hero, you were coming home as uh, something less, you know. When I came back to the United States, I was treated like dirt. I was spit on, I had pop thrown on me. In San Francisco, they uh, there was a walkway 
with a fence and there was so many people cursing and calling us anything you can imagine. And uh, it left a lot of a lot of Vietnam vets angry and very bitter, you know, and I was one of them. And there was a little old lady changed all that. I had a veteran's hat on and she walked up to me and she looked at me and tears in her eyes and she said, thank you. I had just out processed at Fort Dix. You know, we got in the day before from across, from out of the country. So you have to out process before you become a civilian. And it was sort of late in the day and either I could stay at Fort Dix that night and catch the flight home or I could get it going as fast as I could, got a taxi, went to the Philadelphia airport. Um, and then we flew up to LaGuardia or JFK. Then I had to uh, pay to ride a special helicopter. They had like a commuter helicopter flying from LaGuardia to JFK and back and forth. And as a matter of fact, I was in so big of a hurry that my duffel bag handle broke. You know how you, you know, carry them on your shoulder, so my duffel bag handle broke. And so I was you know, trying to carry two duffel bags coming home. And anyway, um, I called my family and asked that they be here. And so when the plane arrived, uh, the, I was the only soldier in uniform coming home. And um, so I guess the stewardess or whatever knew that um, uh, uh, I was coming home, had been home in over a year. And the pilot said, um, make way for this soldier. This is the first time he's been home in over a year. So <laughs> everyone stayed seated and I was allowed to go up and clap their hands and thank me as I went off the plane. I think it's all things considered a legacy of service. We may not all agree with our government all the time, but I think Americans have a, a calling, and one of those callings is service the country. And I would like everyone to ever understand that I and three and a half million other men and women simply answered that calling when it was given. We well, you know I think it was contentious. And I think that uh, for uh, many people, it was a true learning experience. But there were a lot of things that were happening, you know, at that time. First of all, the media was heavily involved in, you would see things every day, every night. There were a lot of things going on at the same time, civil rights. I was raised that if your country called on you, you went and you served to the best of your ability. That was my perspective. For other people, it wasn't that way. So you could see strife. And I'm glad we've got Iraq veterans and Afghanistan veterans whose memories are fresh okay, versus World War II and Korea whose, whose memories aren't maybe quite as sharp. Um, the emotion. I don't know how many people we've, uh, you know, a few laughs, some tears. You, 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 it's hard to convey that on paper. It's hard to convey that in any medium than, you know, uh, a video camera. As the world's dependence on oil became greater with the post-World War II and post-Korean uh, industrialization that was taking place, our need for oil increased exponentially. So with a greater focus on that region of the world, the issue of statehood for Palestine versus the statehood of Israel took on even greater cutting edge importance. That's when the Middle East conflicts between Egypt and the other Arab states came, into, came to pass. And then eventually terrorism raised its ugly head and we became not only focused on what was happening in the Middle East, but we combated it.
I went in uh, in uh, 1985. Um, my grades weren't the best. Um, my grandma had passed away, and you know, I just kind of was giving up on school and didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, the military is always an option, so um, I enlisted in the Army. I wasn't the most uh, motivated high school student, and I uh, really didn't see myself going to college. September 11th came, and I said, well, this, this answers it. I'm going to join the Army now. I knew that I wanted to go to school, so I started looking for ulterior ways to pay for school, and I got a pamphlet one day in my mailbox, and it was said, join the guard, you know, we'll pay 100% tuition, and so I, I looked into it, and and uh, my mom was the postmaster, she knew the guy that was a recruiter from where he'd come in all the time, so he told me, and I said, that sounds kind of fun, that sounds like camping all the time, or you know, I, I was an outdoors kid, you know, riding bicycle and, you know, I thought I was an explorer and did all this stuff when I was a kid, so I thought this was going to be awesome. So there was incoming small arms fire, and we all ran up to the roof, found the direction the fire was coming from. And I remember hearing the whizzing, and the really, the, the miniature sonic boom that a bullet makes when it passes your ear. And I thought, this is just like in the movies. You know, Saving Private Ryan, so do a better job right now. And I remember being on that wall and firing back and just kind of going through the motions. And then after it was all over, I was like, wait a minute. That was real. There's definitely people shooting at us. And so I got kind of scared afterwards, like, oh, what I heard almost took my head off. That's pretty insane. So I worked seven days a week, and I, I pretty much worked every waking minute. So they made me go in R&R &R about halfway through my tour, and they sent me to a country called Qatar. Some people pronounce it Qatar. But on the way back from that R&R, &R, they take all your weapons and your, your support equipment, all your life support equipment, protective, protective gears left behind because you're going to a peaceful country. But on the way back, we got bad weather, and I got diverted to Baghdad. And there was all these other planes diverted to Baghdad, and I didn't even have a helmet. I didn't have a steel pot. I didn't have a handgun. And there was no facilities. They made me stay on this airplane by myself. They let the crew off the airplane to go inside, but they wouldn't let me off the airplane. And it was one of the coldest days I've ever spent in my life. I didn't have a jacket on because I just came from a resort area. And in the daytime, it wasn't too bad in the winter there, but at nighttime, it really dropped well below freezing. I'd say really the worst thing though was uh, the mortar fire and rockets. Uh, getting fired, fired at with mortars was very common. Uh, fortunately, I've, I've probably only had one really fairly close call with that. And uh, that was with an 80 millimeter mortar that came probably within about 35 feet of where I was at. Uh, fortunately, the land of that close wasn't the first one, so we knew it was coming. Uh, in Kuwait, I know a Navy guy and uh, ran into some old ordnance from a tank battle. I, don't, I think it was a rocket or something of that nature. Done a lot of damage to both the equipment he was on and the uh, left him completely deaf for at least as long as I, I know. The Sunnis were just killing the Shias, the Shiites, and uh, everywhere. It, it just started to spread at that time. And uh, but we were in the Sunni Triangle at that time, and we were receiving enemy fire, and people were dying. And I don't know if you call that a you know, major battle or not. I guess not. But it's just what was going on. Like playing uh, roulette. Uh, like I said, our initial contract was six months, and uh, that was all right with us. We didn't care. Uh, we got close to the six-month period, and they told us that the leadership above the Italian level had decided that we needed to stay just a little bit longer. It got into the seventh month. Of course, we'd already packed to go home, so we had to 
kept out just our bare necessities, what we needed to, for our own protection. By the eighth month, they told us we might be there just a little bit longer. When it got to the 12th month, it was almost a mutiny because uh, we'd been told we was going home in so many days, so many times, it was the point where you almost couldn't believe leadership at this point until they finally sent us to the uh, camp that was known to have an airport that was driving, that was flying people out of the country. And once we got there, we still was apprehensive about believing them or not. So finally, they loaded us on planes and started sending us back. <laughs> One of, one of the eye-opening experiences I had while in was when uh, a bunch of us went to watch Air Force One, and there was a moment in there when a, a pilot had to decide whether he was going to place himself in between a harm's way and the president's plane. And at that very moment, I realized, well, crap, that's really what my job is. Um, that's the commander-in-chief. Would you do that? And yeah, you would, because whether you didn't like that person or not as a political person, that's essentially what you signed up to do. That's your job. And um, in the Air Force, they teach you service before self, excellence in all you do and, and integrity. And so you have to put the service before yourself. That's what you're there to do. When we flew out of Mosul, we landed first in uh, Turkey. And there were some civilians there, Americans, in this little room. We came off the plane out of Iraq. We had our rifles. And they were clapping. Welcome us, welcome, not welcome us home, not, the, not a welcome home, but you know, welcome us out of there. And I was surprised. It's like, that was a nice, well, gee, thank you. You know, that was nice. And then we got back to uh, an airport in New Jersey, and I felt like just laying on the ground and hugging the ground just to be home. You know, people don't realize what a wonderful place we have. You know, I kind of went through you know, just some excitement for a few weeks, just getting back, uh, kind of riding that wave, that high. Your back colors were brighter, you know, mm -hmm. versus just seeing camouflage all the time. Um, and then um, just kind of got into like a funk, kind of depression almost. Uh, and I've talked to other guys about it, and they all seem like they go through the same thing about a month, two months into it. But uh, um, I picked myself up. Does it up and end up coming to WVU. Once I had got back, I just feel like I had had this veil lifted from my eyes. That's the best way I can describe it. And you start to really get in tune with what is actually going on throughout the world, not just Baker, West Virginia, or you know Cleveland, Ohio, or wherever somebody's from. It doesn't matter. And I was in a bad place. Uh, I remember probably a, a month or two months where I didn't even leave my room, uh, except to maybe get something to eat or, you know, use a latrine or whatever. Um, but I was just, I didn't want any light coming in. My, I covered my windows up. I just secluded myself because I just didn't feel like anybody would understand uh, what I would be trying to convey to them. Um, and. After about two months of that, um, it was it started getting warm, and um, I heard my nieces and nephews outside playing, and they were just real little kids at the time, and uh, just just their laughter and just hearing them playing and laughing and giggling, and I just realized I got to I got to get out of here. Well, it's a challenge, that's for sure. Every aspect of it, just being an 18 year old kid away from home, um, putting on a ruck, rucksack that weighs, you know, about a third or more as much as you do and running for 12 miles. Mentally, just the, I want to combat arms MOS, it's, we knew when we were training, yeah, this stuff is going to make or break us one day. It's like, this is going to be the difference between... So I guess it was the gravity of the whole experience, as well as just the... I mean, just, it was tough. It was hard. It was a very hard life. And uh, that's, that's what I remember most, really. 
just every, every aspect of it challenging in some different way. You know, now the project faced a new challenge. It was how we would organize it and then present it to the public so that we could honor not only the accomplishments, but the tradition of service of so many West Virginians. All of these great ideas were coming together, including the idea for this film. And all I could think was, who's going to sift through all this? And as for the film, I'm thinking, is everyone aware that these weren't even going to be shot for video? I mean, it was an oral history project. Um, Basically, we were just getting the information down and transcribing it. We weren't really in intending at first to have everything shown. Um, some of this stuff was on VHS tapes. Transcriptions. <laughs> yeah, transcriptions for sure. Just listening over and over, really, really high volume, really slowly, trying to figure out exactly what they said so you can make it perfect. That's definitely one of the harder aspects of it. I got a call that they was interested in me doing some photography, uh, documenting the, you know, the veterans. And so I was really excited. I was glad to, to be able to be a part of that. When Mark came on board, the energy level of the project just exploded. Mark's photographs inspired us to create the Tradition of Service Veterans Legacy Photo Exhibit. After that, the next logical step was to create a book, Heroes Among Us, which is a montage of all the photos, both old and new, and quotes and stories from veterans. And it was, it was good for the veterans in order to express some of the things that, that they'd long kept to themselves, although no veteran readily talks about combat. That more people will, will hopefully interview their own families. There's just not enough manpower for us to, to, to do all the interviews. That if people can do the interviews and submit them so that it could be uh, archived here at the college for future generations to enjoy and learn about their ancestors. I would like people to say, you know, hey, that's my great uncle, you know, 20, 30 years from now, 40, 50 years from now, I want people to be able to say, you know, that was my great, great grandfather that we're learning about World War II from. You can say, I think it should be done. I wish it would be done. I hope it would be done. But in fact, we're doing it. We're saving the memories of those who have given so much in the past so that those memories can be preserved for the future. To me, this is a wonderful project you all are doing. It's going to give our younger generations, the generations that follow us, an idea of what men, not only men, but women, have sacrificed and did preserve our freedom in this country. When the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be faithful to a home so fair as we raise our voices in this solemn prayer, please join me. <laughs>